now sadhvi bhagavati saraswati ji is going to speak about happy holy and healthy how to tap into the scientific connection between our emotions spirituality and health it's a wonderful wonderful honor and a wonderful joy to be here today when we talk about the connection between happiness our emotions and our health let us first start by looking at where does happiness even come from what makes us happy a scientist by academic history and by much of my mind and so even after i had come on to this beautiful spiritual path when i was back in america i conducted an experiment it was a personal experiment and the experiment was i found about 10 or 12 people i knew all of whom were at the very very top of their different fields so for example a billionaire ceo of a company a tenured professor at stanford university a well known hollywood actress someone who was a very famous basketball player for the la lakers all of these people at the very pinnacle of their professions and when i went back to america i made it a point to speak with each of them and when i spoke to them i asked them all one question and the question was are you happy and what i found was remarkable every single one of them told me one of two answers either i will be happy when and you can fill in the blank the mortgage is paid off the kids grow up and move out of the house lose 10 pounds my husband works a little bit less or i would be happy if i earned a little bit more money we had a house in a better area of town i got the promotion that i wanted the kids would clean up their rooms whatever it was but for every single one of these people people who had attained the absolute highest in their fields people who had reached what the rest of the world is forsaking their health their time their spiritual practice to reach every one of those people still had one thing between them and happiness not one of them could say yes i'm happy now and to me that was such a significant study because the rest of us run and run and run to get to be where they are if you're in business obviously you'd love to be a billionaire ceo if you're in sports you'd love to have a starting place on an important sports team if you're an actress or an actor or a model or a singer you'd love to be famous and in hollywood and for these people there was still one thing between them and happiness people who win the lottery they have found every single one of them in a period of a couple of years goes back to their level of happiness that they had before they won the lottery hundreds of millions of dollars what everybody dreams about if only i could win the lottery then then i'd be happy but those who win the lottery sure for a few weeks even a few months there's an increase and then they're right back to where they were before what does this tell us it tells us that none of these things are that which bring us happiness if i have everything and yet there's still one thing between me and happiness it means it's not in any of those things i come from america where we've attained everything 
obtained everything, acquired everything, achieved everything. But you know what the top 10 medicines prescribed in America are? Antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicine, sleeping pills, and Viagra. After attaining everything, acquiring everything, we have to take pills to do what animals can do. A pill to go to sleep at night. A pill to drag ourselves out of bed in the morning. A pill to procreate. What are we doing? Mahatma Gandhiji said it beautifully. He said, what's the point of running so fast when we're running in the wrong direction? And that's what's happening with our lives. We're running after all of these things that we think are going to bring us happiness and peace and joy and meaning. We acquire them all. And then we need a pill to go to sleep at night. A pill to convince ourselves that life is worth living. A pill to quiet our racing hearts. And then... Then we run straight into the hands of the media. Look at advertising. It doesn't matter what we're trying to sell. We're selling happiness. Whether it's in the form of a mobile phone, new clothes, a new house, a new car, every one of the commercials is selling happiness. Take, for example, soap. It's my favorite example. What does soap do? Soap cleans us. And so, if I were going to do an honest commercial for soap, I would say to you, this brand of soap cleans you better than that brand of soap. But we never do. What does a soap commercial look like? A beautiful woman, and she's, she's singing in the shower first thing in the morning as she's lathering up, and then her equally beautiful husband walks into the bathroom and he's also singing. They walk out of the bathroom together, hand in hand. Their child, also beautiful, has managed to get himself up, dressed himself, done his homework, eaten his Wheaties and he's ready for school. We're not selling soap. We're selling happiness. And the rest of us walk away from that commercial believing on some unconscious level that if we don't feel like singing in the shower at 6 o'clock in the morning or if our husbands or wives don't sing when they come into the bathroom as we're getting ready, drag our kids out of bed in the morning and force them to get dressed and force them to do their homework, it's because we're using the wrong brand of soap. We're looking, we're searching for this elusive happiness. And we've gotten so frenetic and so frenetic in our search that we've turned advertising into a billion dollar industry. We're literally changing our brands of soaps, our brands of dishwashing liquid, our, our jeans, our mobile phones, believing that somehow, if I just use that, look like this, go here, attain this, then, then I'll be happy. The Bhagavad Gita tells us, Lord Krishna says in the Gita, he is a yogi to whom a lump of clay, a handful of dirt, and a brick of gold are the same. Now, what could he possibly mean? A yogi doesn't have dull sensations. It's not that his hand can't tell the difference between a brick of gold, dirt, and A yogi's perceptions are heightened. Of course he can tell the difference. So what is the Gita telling us? It means that for that which is important, for my life, for my purpose on earth, a lump of clay and a brick of gold are the same. Neither of them is any more likely than the other 
to bring me what I need in my life, to provide me with that happiness, with that peace, with that meaning. Indian culture tells us that the entire reason we've been put on earth, the point of our birth, is to realize our unity with God, our oneness with God, to realize that divine within ourselves, within others. But not just to realize it intellectually, to experience it, to experience that connection with God, first deep within our own hearts, and then in the hearts and the beings of all of those with whom we share this planet. That's the source. That's the source of everything. The source of happiness. The source of peace. The source of joy. The source of meaning. Is that connection. That divine anchor. That's, that's the source. But what does that have to do with health? What's the connection between finding that source of joy and health in our beings? Much of science today, tragically, still believes that the body is material, just a mass, unconscious, unthinking, and the mind is the only thing that thinks, the only thing that's conscious. But luckily today, there are huge, burgeoning fields of psychoneuroimmunology, mind-body connection, holistic medicine, that tell us no. The body is subject, yes, of course, to the laws of nature, but it's also subject to the laws of the mind, to the power of thought. Duke University, one of the biggest universities in America, did a study several years ago. It took thousands and thousands of people, and they watched them for 20 years, measuring all of the different lifestyle aspects, what they eat, how they live, do they exercise, everything. And at the end of this study, they found something amazing. They weren't even looking for this. They were looking to find out what type of food, what type of air, what type of exercise keeps people alive. And they found something completely different. They found people who regularly attend a place of worship. And it doesn't matter if it's a church, a temple, a synagogue, a gudwara, the divine corner in your own house, the base of a tree in your backyard, the feet of your grandparents, the feet of your guru. It doesn't matter. But a place of worship. People who regularly attend a place of worship were 25% less likely to die of any cause than people who didn't. Dartmouth University, another very well-known university, as they've got a big hospital there with an expertise in cardiac, people who have had heart attacks. As from having had a heart attack, in addition to the rest of their intake, they asked these people one question. How religious or spiritual are you? And at the end of six months, people who had said they weren't religious or spiritual at all, 11% of them had had another heart attack from which they had died. That's standard. It's about 10 to 12% of people within six months of the first heart attack have another fatal one. But what about those who had checked very religious or very spiritual? After six months, not one had died. Not one. What does this tell us? It's not that the air in our temples or churches or gurdwaras is somehow healthier than the air outside. We're not handing out multivitamins as prashad or communion. We're not all running medical care clinics next to our places of worship. There is something inherently, 
deeply connected to faith and to prayer that keeps only our minds, our hearts intact, but that keeps our bodies intact and that keeps our bodies healthy. Lastly, in the last minute, there was a sign that I saw on a church recently that said, you know, as you're driving by these churches of these wonderful signs outside, and the sign said, watch your thoughts and you will see the future. Watch your thoughts and you will see the future. The future of your own heart, the future of your mind, and the future of your body. That which we think, that which we feel, the way in which we pray, the way in which we connect, it's not just about the 15 or 20 or 30 minutes a day we spend in our sadhana. It's about who we become based on that. And that determines how we think, how we live, who we are, and how healthy we are. So here in this beautiful parliament, as we have these very, very special days, let us find, find that source not outside yourself, not in this teacher or that teacher, but to realize that all of that which you're learning and hearing is just about reconnecting you to that divine, to that inner source, from which the mind and the thought changes, and from the minds and the thoughts, the whole being, the whole life, and the world around us, everyone we touch, everyone we meet, it all changes. And that, that's the power and the divine connection that we all have. Thank you.